Good afternoon everyone. I am Ritesh, a senior research fellow with affiliation in both IA and Aries. I am going to talk about space weather uh, which is basically the Sun-Earth connection. So how is the relationship between the Sun and the Earth and what are its drivers? So is it something like this? Yeah. So. Uh, or is it more complicated than this simple cartoon diagram which I am showing here? So through the course of time in say one hour or so, I will be discussing the various aspects of space weather and how this Sun-Earth relationship goes. So uh, starting with just what weather is. So let me give you an example of uh, uh, our national capital, New Delhi. So where on June 29th, uh, it was recorded around 40 degrees. So when I ask uh, what's the weather there, generally people refer that it's 40 degrees with some cloudy stuff or it's windy or something like that. So this is the basic understanding of our weather. Like in our day to day life, we even call to our family members and ask like, how's the weather there, mom? So it's something like that. Apart from this, we also have some temperature history, like what are the minimum and maximum temperature that can go that day or before day and some more advanced uh, information. So this is just about talking about a particular location. So even if you can uh, look for your particular location, like say uh, Nainital or Bangalore, and you can get the weather information about that place. Uh, but here I talked about space weather, what it looks like. So I have taken this image from uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, which monitors the space weather. So here I have shown I guess uh, some plots with uh, some quantities given in the left side. So this is again uh, the weather, uh, space weather on the similar timeline, 28th June 2020, recently I guess. And uh, there are some parameters, uh, B, density, speed, temperature. So uh, nothing to worry about all these plots because I'm going to talk about what all these things are and how it is useful for us. So how is it defined? So according to the famous Wikipedia Baba, the space weather is defined as like a branch of space physics, aeronomy or heliophysics concerned with the time varying condition within the solar system, including the solar wind emphasizing the space around the Earth, including conditions in magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere and exosphere. Uh, but uh, you all know about uh, these magnetosphere, ionosphere and other things. Uh, but I am not going to talk details about this part. I will be focusing mostly from the heliophysics point of view uh, because this is Sun-Earth connection, so how Sun is going to affect the surroundings of the Earth. And uh, the famous uh, space agency, NASA, if you go to their web page of space weather, they also define like if you have some changes on Earth, you, you have some weather report on Earth. So similar to that, if you have some disturbance in space environment around it, that you term as the space weather. But uh, what exactly it is, so you, you have a beautiful diagram here. So if you are interested, you can just go to this particular web page and look into it. And there are some more information given about space weather, like uh, magnetic storms produce some uh, effects on and near Earth. So why this guy is curious about this? So this will be uh, unrevealed uh, with the course of our time in next one hour. So let's dive a bit in the timeline. So in 1724, uh, some people like uh, George Graham and Andres Celsius, yes, the very Celsius guy, the temperature guy, he's a like, very famous physicist. So in Sweden uh, and in England, they simultaneously noticed that there was a deviation in compass and that lasted more than a day. Why is it uh, curious to know? Just imagine, just you know that uh, compass needle always points towards north. And if there is some deflection in it, it's not pointing at the north, then what does it mean? Uh, you are not definitely going to be attacked by something or some uh, mysterious force, but something might have happened, but they didn't know that what has happened. So this was like kind of a record which they had put like, okay, all of a sudden the uh, compass is showing some other direction. So yeah, in those days, they didn't have GPS and satellites for nav navigation and compass was the only thing that kept them going, uh, especially in the sea voyages and all. So that was a kind of concern during those old days. And uh, further com coming forward in time, in 1801, you can see there was a total solar eclipse. And during those times, they didn't have some uh, cameras or like even mobile phones to capture the, those kind of spectacular events. So they used to hand draw the things. So here, the thing which is blocked is the solar disk by the moon and the beautiful flowery pattern, which you see here, 
uh, is basically the atmosphere of the sun. So this is one of the first record of uh, solar eclipse which we have like uh, in hard copies. After that, in 1848, some years uh, like when the telegraph and other things were being in use, so it disrupted uh, across Europe and North America simultaneously. So how can it happen like all of a sudden Europe and North America, both the continents are getting this kind of disturbances? Because if there is an alien attack, those will be mostly focused in US and something like that. But how can it happen that Europe and North America are getting affected simultaneously? So yeah, this was again a curious thing like uh, in 1724 something was uh, peculiar happened and here again something like that happened. But what was driving that? Uh, nobody knew back then. In 1859, this guy, Carrington and uh, his companion, Oxen, they uh, noticed something like this. So this is uh, uh, looking very cute little picture where there are some spots which are basically the sunspots. This is the picture of the uh, solar disk where you can see 20 degree, 40 degree, these are the longitudes. And 20 degree north is the latitude at which this particular sunspot group was uh, visible. On this particular day, 1st September 1859, they observed that in this very complex sunspot group, there was a brightening, uh, which is shown here like a kidney-shaped uh, structure here. So they didn't have very high resolution instruments, so they just uh, put this kind of instrument, by, uh, sorry, depiction. But it's interesting from uh, what we understand now. So uh, this is the first record which we call now as solar flare. But how is it related? Uh, yeah, we'll come to this every bit of it. And then in 1860, one year after this uh, famous event, there, there was another total solar eclipse. And uh, in this particular image, apart from those flower-like structure, there was something. And this is that something which I will be talking in the future slide. And this looks like D or uh, Sigma or whatever you can uh, look at uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, further, in uh, 1941, so I am jumping uh, like around 80 years in the history, when the again TV and radio broadcasts were interrupted, now just in USA. And what was the result of this interruption? There was a baseball match going between Brooklyn and Pittsburgh, and that got interrupted at a very uh, high voltage time. And uh, yeah, people were uh, like very much furious about with the broadcasters, like how can it happen that at the very moment, which was like the decisive moment for the uh, match, and they had interrupted the signal, but they didn't know that uh, that interruption didn't happen on Earth, but it was coming somewhere outside the space. And uh, further, in uh, 1971, there was a satellite orbiting solar observatory that discovers a coronal transient. So what is a coronal transient? So as I uh, shown earlier that when the solar disk is blocked, you can see a beautiful flower-like pattern outside. So in that image, they observed something moving outward. In this particular image, uh, the location where I am pointing at present. Uh, so you might be thinking that, okay, you have gone to space and then taking a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy picture like this. Yeah, that was 1970s, where we didn't have the high resolution camera that we have even in our mobile phones. So yeah, that was the best picture of that time. Uh, yeah, but we didn't know what exactly it's happening, but uh, this is like perhaps the first time transient is was observed from this space. Interestingly, in that very same decade, uh, the first space station by United States, which was known as Skylab, it entered back to Earth before its scheduled time. So it was, I think, uh, uh, scheduled for one or two years uh, uh, still to be in space. But this created a havoc in the throughout the world that it's going to crash and no one knows where, where it will be crashing. So this was like around 100 tons of weight from space coming back to Earth and that to it like a free fall kind of thing. And uh, just imagine the kind of devastation that could have caused if uh, it had landed in a, uh, like a, a colony or somewhere. But uh, luckily, uh, it fell in Indian Ocean and near Australia and some debris were still found uh, in the Australian land. So this was like kind of a space accident and uh, yeah, NASA was heavily criticized for not able to control this very big uh, spacecraft from space. And then in 1989, there was a Quebec blackout. So what is Quebec actually? Uh, it's a state uh, in southern Canada, somewhere around here. 
so there was some stream of particles that were moving down and uh, generally what happens like uh, uh, it was um, it was uh, found that all, only the uh, northern polar uh, locations used to get uh, affected uh, in these kind of storms but in this case the location which was like very uh, low latitude that also got affected like Quebec was located somewhere around here and that was kind of a strange surprise to everyone that what what is happening like why is it getting blocked out like so they, those people I think for three or four days they were without electricity so this was the case of 1989 imagine you living uh, without electricity for uh, three or four days uh, uh, now so after this, uh, in 1994, again, three satellites failed at the same time. Uh, Anik uh, E1, Anik E2, Intelsat. And uh, yeah, this was like, uh, again, a mystery that uh, how can all of a sudden three spacecraft stopped, stopped functioning? If something might have happened, then OK, one is fine. But three at a time, yeah, that's, that, that gives us a question mark. And in 2003, there were famous Halloween storms between October and November. That was the whole Halloween time in uh, Europe and uh, uh, United States. So at uh, this time, there was a, uh, even accident in space, like some of the spacecrafts got damaged. There were satellites known as SOHO and ACE. Uh, ACE uh, had some of the instruments got damaged because of these kind of storms from the space. And in Europe, uh, these kind of images were taken, like yellow lights were seen across the Europe. And one thing uh, in throughout this history which I have talked about that was common is the appearance of beautiful auroras, the northern lights in it, even to the lower latitude regions. So someone asked me a few days back like, uh, yeah, these are the beautiful events and we should visit. And uh, I agree that, yeah, we should definitely visit. We should make a plan. And I guess everyone should uh, plan something about this thing and uh, uh, pay it a visit to uh, see either the northern lights or the southern lights. But uh, uh, I don't know how many people know that this is related to space weather phenomena. Moving forward, what's next? We will come to this particular thing. What is actually coming to us uh, by the end of this talk? So uh, going back again, uh, relating to the previous talk, the last week, which was given by this uh, bright young guy with a dark glass who talked about dark spots on the sun, the sunspots. And he uh, told how these sunspots, which are manifested as the, the cool dark regions in the solar disk, appear as bright regions in the outer atmosphere. So. Uh, if we look into the um, atmosphere from photosphere to chromosphere to even higher heights, so you can see the decrease in uh, the density, a steep decrease in density, but at the same time there is an increase in temperature. So uh, the decreased in density is fine, but the increase in temperature, yeah, that's still a mystery and that problem is again called coronal heating. So a brief introduction about what is famous uh, these days from like I think six months, corona, but uh, Thankfully, I am not going to talk about this particular corona today, so you can be relaxed on it. You are already uh, reading about it and listening to it in the news channels uh, these days. So uh, we'll just talk about the solar corona, which is way hotter than what is in the disk. So just a brief summary of how the solar atmosphere looks in different wavelengths. So uh, last week we have already witnessed, uh, I think, yes, uh, these part, this part, this part. So which was uh, basically the continuum, the photosphere part. So what thing you should uh, notice here is the sunspot, this, this group, uh, which uh, in the magnetic mag magnetogram looks something like this. But uh, in the photosphere, those appear as dark features. But if the same thing, uh, you are looking in higher in corona and uh, where the temperature, if you just uh, look the this uh, second layer, uh, second line, the temperature like 6,000 Kelvin, 1 million Kelvin, 2 million Kelvin, and up to 10 million Kelvin. The same spot is appearing as bright feature in the corona. So uh, you can see that uh, as you go higher up in the corona, it becomes uh, hotter and hotter and even denser. So uh, what appears as dark may be bright in other locations. So just uh, uh, this uh, is actually the emission corona because these are the, uh, like in the school you have noticed that whenever the, there is atomic or ionic transition, then you get some wavelength. So all these uh, images which you are seeing here are the part of emission corona because the light is being emitted because of the transition from N1 to N2 levels. But how does it look in uh, say white light? So for that we have a beautiful 
uh, solar eclipse images in which again you can see those flower like structures all around the disk but this is a high resolution image and there are again some things but uh, this is uh, perhaps more beautiful than those sketches uh, the sketches have their own value but uh, yeah here also you can see but uh, why is it that uh, in the day-to-day -day life you don't see these kind of structures why is it that always uh, you can see this thing uh, during the total solar eclipse the reason is that the brightness of this corona is million times less as compared to the photosphere so uh, just imagine million times means 10 for uh, one followed by six zeros so uh, you can imagine the how big difference is that number so uh, until unless you block the solar disk light you won't be able to see this atmosphere and at the same time just to summarizing the temperature yeah it's uh, way hot like million ke degree kelvin you cannot imagine sitting uh, in like even the what worst we, we we are seeing even sitting even in delhi is like 45 to 50 degree celsius and just imagine 1 million kelvin okay that's too hot yeah and how is it linked to the emission corona? Yeah, uh, in this particular image, you see that all the structures, the fine patterns, which you see in the white light images, have actually the roots uh, deeper in the, uh, near the disk. So in the emission corona, what you see here, the loop kind of structure here, the fine pattern, which is merging out in the uh, white light corona. So all these things are actually linked to each other. And if one want to know what is going uh, around, they need, they need to connect what is actually happening from inside the sun to what is happening outside the sun. Why I'm telling all this? Because this is uh, the lab where you need you you can test actually many of your theories of plasma magnetohydrodynamics and even nuclear physics and how do you observe since i just now mentioned that uh, the corona is million times less bright as compared to the uh, solar disk so how do you observe so you you have some instrument called coronagraph so what do you do actually you block the disk light here in part this particular image i have three instrument AIA, LASCO C2, and LASCO C3. So the center one is the AIA image, which only takes the disk image, whereas LASCO C2 is the uh, red region, which a uh, field of view starts from around two solar radii, and uh, uh, LASCO C3 is the blue region, which uh, field of view starts from around four solar radii. So you can see that you need to block the disk light up to a considerable distance, then only you will be able to see those atmospheric patterns, those petal-like structures, those fine, beautiful corona uh, pattern. So, uh, sorry, yeah. So just comparing the different space-based uh, coronagraphs that we have at present, which are functioning and the uh, past and the uh, future. So SOHO, uh, one of the uh, NASA ESA collaboration uh, spacecraft has three uh, coronagraphs actually, but uh, unfortunately LASCO C1, which observed closest to the solar disk from 1.1 solar radii, stopped working after uh, one accident in 1998, but we still have LASCO C2 and LASCO C3. Apart from the SOHO spacecraft, there was STEREO, a uh, pair of uh, STEREO uh, satellites which were launched in 2000, late 2006, and it has CORE 1 and CORE 2, two coronagraphs. And in future, India is going to launch Aditya L1 with one coronagraph, which is known as BLC. And if you notice, like after LASCO C1, which is no more functional, uh, the nearest field of view of sun which we can get at present of the solar atmosphere is from 1.4 solar radii which is of stereo core 1. Uh, so till now we don't have much information what happens below 1.4 so for that Aditya will be of very great importance from the point of view uh, uh, from not only solar science but also from space weather to fill the gap which I am showing you in this particular image where this black region is the unexplored region and that is where Aditya is going to uh, come and yeah this is kind of advertisement for the next year ISRO uh, mission from India. So marking about what actually brings space weather so this movie you saw last week also that magnetic field lines rise up from the photosphere and those appear as dark regions in the uh, and appear as sunspots and it may so happen that these field lines get stretched so when these get stretched uh, and uh, because of the shearing motion of the foot points of these things they get they store magnetic energy and when they get stretched they get reconnected and reconfigured 
And then you can see that there are two components. One is still holding onto the surface. Yeah, that may be called as a ground to sun. Okay, though it's not ground to earth. And the other one is launched in space. So how are these things connected to us? So that's what the talk is about. That whatever is released, uh, here you can see that the, these are magnetic field structures and along with it some material from the hot solar atmosphere. So that's the uh, brief flow chart about space weather drivers, like what is actually driving the space weather. So the three basic components I will be talking about, mostly focusing on flares and CMEs, and uh, shocks and SEPs, solar energetic particles, are those drivers or the post effects of the these drivers, that will be a kind of curious thing for this minion guy. So what is a flare? So if you remember uh, the movie Iron Man in 2008, in the climax scene when he was fighting Iron Monger and he, I think, uh, was disarmed with uh, one side and uh, uh, he just tells Jarvis to start the flare. And what happens in the next scenes, you can see that all of a sudden it starts to be bright enough so that this guy is like blinded for a few seconds because it was too bright for him to handle. So in similar way, what are solar flares? So it is defined as like brightening of any emission in the electromagnetic spectrum that can be sudden or gradual and can last two hours. So coming back to this particular image uh, of sunspots and flare by Carrington guy. So uh, here in between sunspots, the white thing which he saw that day, the though he didn't have much idea of what it was happening, but now we know that it's actually solar flare and it can be seen in any part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So how does it look at present? So let's jump to this SDO image at present and just focusing on this particular region and see what happens here. So this is a composite of three different wavelengths, 171, 193, and 271. So you can see that suddenly there is a brightening in this particular uh, interesting region, which we call as active region. And apart from this, there are some motion of plasma uh, around it. So what is actually happening? That is called a flare. So in UV, extreme ultraviolet wavelength, this kind of thing is happening. But how does it uh, reflect in other wavelengths? So here is a summary picture. So I was just uh, telling you here about the UV images where you can see slowly the intensity is rising to a peak value and then it will decrease over a span of say uh, tens of minutes to maybe some hours or so. But the same feature if you observe in different wave bands like hard x-ray or microwave, you can see that the impulsiveness, the peak value reaches at different times. So in UV, if it is uh, the flash, you can see uh, is it say uh, T equal to some T2, but in hard x-ray it is happening in T1 which is not the same as T2. Similarly for H alpha, it is happening even lower. Here, uh, as I talked about H alpha and uh, soft X-rays and UVs, uh, let's see, look about the classification of these kind of flares. So uh, mostly uh, as they were observed in H alpha and soft X-rays, their classification based on their either in the basis of their area on the solar disk or based on the uh, peak intensity which they showed in different soft X-ray waves, they were classified. So the um, faintest of them uh, in H-alpha is classified as S, whereas in soft X-rays it was A-type. So uh, the power you can see, it's ranging from 10 power minus 8 to 10 more than 10 power minus 4 watt per meter square in this particular wavelength. So uh, if you look in this uh, chart, the uh, weakest is A-class a flare and the strongest is the X-class. Anything more than uh, power of 10 power minus 4 watts per meter square, those are all classified as X-class flare, flare. So next time if someone tells you or in news article or even in a popular science article tell you that, okay, some say X-class flare happened and uh, people on Earth need to be careful about their communication and television. Yeah, so you can tell that how much energy might have released. And one interesting thing that how much is this energy? So typically, uh, this kind of uh, uh, flare can give the uh, energy output equivalent to billions of megatons of TNT. So how much is that? So for your information, the combined explosion of Hiroshima and Nagasaki constituted to around 40 uh, uh, kilotons of TNT. So now just imagine, 
it's close to 40 kilotons and here i am talking about billions of megatons so that's a huge difference like uh, wow that's that's the, that was the worst disaster we we faced and uh, the thing that's happening in the sun is like way on a larger scale and uh, yeah since there are h alpha observations also so uh, just uh, a brief introduction like okay from aries also we have a 15 centimeter h alpha telescope where we observe flares so here you can see the evolution of flare from uh, just starting to a peak value uh, a very intense brightening of a uh, uh, particular of 28 october 20, 2003 so this is just an example that uh, how in h alpha these kind of flares may look like and uh, what uh, uh, actually this uh, X-ray people observe, so there is a satellite called GOES X-ray satellite, which uh, there are a series of satellites of GOES, uh, which monitor the space weather. So whenever the flare happens, you can see the fluctuations uh, in the intensity of the X-ray. So in the left side, you can see the uh, output, uh, which it's recording. On the right side, what you see is the different classification. And the time axis you see from sept uh, September 8 to September 11 of 2017. So this is a very recent flare, a very popular flare of this decade. And solar physicists went crazy after this event. And there were like n number of publications from this very single event. So you can see that there are a very uh, large number of peaks in this uh, particular phase. Interestingly, there was one X-class flare that happened on uh, uh, September 10th, uh, 2017. And there were um, many M-class flares. So this was the one which uh, uh, almost uh, uh, launched something uh, and uh, we got ourselves lucky enough that we were not in that part and I will tell you what was actually that particular thing. Moving forward, I have talked about flare a bit. Move, the next thing uh, is obviously CME thing. So what are CMEs? CMEs are actually coronal mass ejections in full and uh, historically it was defined as anything that is moving uh, anything white light feature that is moving outward and expanding in coronograph field of view. So in this particular example, the feature, the white light feature which was moving on the right, right direction, yeah, here it is coming, yeah, this particular feature, that is called a coronal mass ejection. And this is the example of the very same day, 10th September 2017. And this coronal mass ejection uh, was launched on the western solar limb. Imagine if it had launched at the center of the disk and would have been coming towards us and uh, yeah, people felt that, okay, we are lucky enough that uh, such kind of event didn't occur towards us. So uh, uh, what is the structure of these kind of uh, uh, events, coronal mass ejection? So basically, this is the classic three-part structure having a leading edge, a cavity and a bright core. So what actually leading edge is, it consists of plasma material which is swept by a magnetic flux rope in the cavity region. So uh, imagine uh, you pulling a very big rope in the sandy beach. So when you are pulling the rope from both the sides uh, and dragging it along it, so whatever the material that you are sweeping uh, along with you is kind of forming the leading edge. And the rope is the magnetic flux rope which is forming actually the cavity in this particular case. And there is a bright core region, uh, which is the prominent uh, prominence material, the cool material and the dense material from uh, solar surface lying just beneath these kind of flux ropes. So if you just uh, go back to the historical solar eclipse image where I told you that there was something which was peculiar observed in that particular thing. And if you just rotate it and you can find uh, quite a bit of similarity between uh, the, those two structures that there are okay round structures and then there was another structure inside it. So that may be kind of a bright core for this particular case. So already it's uh, very rare to find solar eclipse. And on the top of that, you have captured a coronal mass ejection. Wow, that was fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, uh, again, that uh, same movie. Uh, CME is moving outwards, but uh, you can observe some more things are happening in this our field of view, in this coronagraph image. All of a sudden, the, st then the number of stars are increasing. Is it really happening or are we missing something? So what are the stars actually? Uh, how can all of a sudden coronal mass ejection is present and uh, you can see more stars and that too in the daytime, the sun side? So the answer to this comes from the shocks and SAPs. So let us talk a bit about shocks and SAPs. So what are shocks? Definitely not uh, when the Thor hits you with his lightning and you get uh, electrocuted with the electric shock, but 
something like this whenever you might have seen that whenever something is being launched and it reaches it crosses the medium speed it generates a kind of a uh, shock like uh, in the jet planes you uh, hear the sonic boom and something like that so similar to that uh, you, even during the rocket launches also it can happen and this kind of feature like a very faint fuzzy compressed uh, uh, structure is actually the shock in our case and uh, for us like uh, what is driving the shock here there is a coronal mass ejection and uh, I may have missed uh, to tell you that space is not empty there are always plasma particles that streaming out from the sun and we live in plasma and yeah we are not living in a vacuum so vacuum is uh, the, there is no perfect definition of vacuum I guess so uh, if the CME is ejected with such a huge uh, speed, the, pl the plasma particles in this medium, the space around uh, sun and uh, the, the sun earth line, they get compressed. And when they do so, they generate the shock. These materials, uh, these plasma particles get accelerated. And when they do so, they emit also in radio waves. So here I am showing you an example of radio spectrum uh, measuring from uh, 0.2 megahertz to 10 megahertz and the signature which you are seeing here the drift in the frequency is actually corresponding to a particular shock event uh, in which the uh, ions the electrons get accelerated and they start uh, emitting in radio wavelengths and uh, apart from this, you also saw that there is enhancement in some very very bright uh, structures in our uh, images so if you remember the CCD lecture, uh, uh, which was a part of uh, ARIC lecture series, you might have uh, came across that whenever there is an overflow of uh, you know, particle overflow of intensities, then these get saturated. And when they do so, they produce these kind of uh, patterns. And these are not stars. These are only the charged particles hitting the CCDs, the imaging uh, detector, which are uh, at the back of the telescope. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, how to ca compare it that they are saturated? Yeah, just go out and uh, try to capture sun with your mobile, though it's not recommended, but you will find that it's all white. So yeah, that's what is saturation. And uh, uh, be careful that uh, th as there are n number of uh, streaks in here, so there are some uh, UFO, UFO aspirants which take these kind of uh, structures and they give it like say head or something and they say that okay something strange is happening and uh, uh, seen in the field of view near the sun and NASA is hiding something from us okay so uh, be careful those are not UFOs those are actually the charged particles those are, those, those are hitting the detectors and uh, yeah so be careful from the such kind of fake news and all and uh, as I mentioned that these kind of charged particles are coming towards us so you will see a spike uh, in its density so there are different uh, uh, satellites orbiting around the earth and uh, whenever these kind of uh, events happen uh, the number density increases so here you can see the spike uh, there was uh, like a kind of a background number of particles uh, per centimeter square but all of a sudden on this particular day 10th September there was a huge spike and uh, uh, it rose to uh, say number like say uh, hundreds to thousands times so imagine that uh, all of a sudden uh, you ha you are receiving one one electron at a time and you are getting now thousand electrons wow that's amazing that all of a sudden you are getting so many particles so uh, things were not as simple a few years back or should I say a few decades back uh, just now I told you that uh, CME was responsible for driving those kind of uh, uh, particles but uh, before 1990s, uh, it was believed that the solar flares which were happening in the solar surface, those are responsible to generate a huge number of particles, uh, large shocks, and uh, even uh, those kind of radio disturbances. So uh, even up to say 1992, this was the perception of the solar physics community that uh, these kind of flares which are happening at the surface of the sun, those are launching particles in the interplanetary medium and causing this uh, um, scintillation, the shocks and uh, these uh, solar energetic particles, SEPs, which I told just now. So how did it all change? Uh, it was because of this guy, uh, Dr. John Gosling. So uh, he came up with his famous paper in 1993 uh, titled The Solar Flare Myth and uh, he discarded single-handedly that the paradigm that uh, uh, this uh, all the 
geomagnetic activities, the space weather activities are because of the flares and is caused by something uh, more different, which is also a result of the magnetic activity on the sun, which he which is popularly known as coronal mass ejection. So imagine a community of scientists, which was uh, uh, happening, uh, which was more focused that on the belief that solar flare is the cause of everything. And all of a sudden, one guy and tells that, okay, you all are wrong. Uh, it's not just the solar flare. CME is causing. Uh, compare it with like. Uh, general relativity everyone knows that einstein uh, uh, general relativity theory is uh, th like well established and all of a sudden someone comes and tells okay hey general relativity has many flaws in it and uh, this some new theory uh, supports the observation more accurately so something like that happened he was heavily criticized and there were very much debate happening in uh, america and uh, uh, even a separate conference was called in the, the same year just to settle this debate that what actually is causing the space weather effect, the space weather uh, near the Earth, what is actually uh, changing it. And finally, it was settled later. Uh, so in his, this paper, what he uh, fo focused he, that uh, on the left side, there is X-ray intensity, X-axis is again time, and uh, on the right side, there is altitude. So altitude is for CME and X-ray intensity is for flares. So you can see here that even though the flare uh, has not reached its peak, there is onset of CME. So uh, CME, if you look from the time direction, uh, the CME is already at some particular height, but flare peak is happening after some time. So it may so happen that flare may be related to CME, to one of the foot points in this particular example, and CME has already begun its launch. So in say T minus five, CME is ready to launch and flare is observed after some time. So this was like kind of revolutionary idea, though it uh, was heavily criticized. But now we all know that it's CME which comes to us along with plasma and magnetic field and not just a flare, which is uh, like the intense brightening. So uh, just uh, trying to connect uh, those two uh, scenes into one. Uh, in this particular example, which I showed you as a video a few slides back, the magnetic field lines, which uh, contains plasma along with it, they get stretched. And when they get stretched, they come very much close to each other. And if you notice here that there is an arrow pointing uh, in one direction, and uh, what does the arrow signify? That the field lines are originating from North Pole and going towards the South Pole. So what happens when you bring the North and South Pole close to each other? They like kind of attract each other, they like each other. So they don't want to, them to leave. So yeah, that, that's what happens here. That's what we call as magnetic reconnection. So that's the procedure of reconnection and reconfiguration of magnetic field lines. So you, you saw in that video that the outer guy left the, uh, this uh, particular region and moved outwards, whereas these guys stayed happily ever after in the solar surface. So that same thing, uh, uh, which we now call as the standard flare CME models, where the field lines come closer, uh, so close that uh, they are inseparable in this particular location, which is called a current sheet. So it looks something like this. The opposite polarities come close. And then when they reconnect, the there are like uh, upflows and downflows. So this guy uh, forms the CME and the uh, other people, they just move down and forms the loop. So yeah, this is pretty much simple. And uh, there was like a kind of long debate that what is causing what, but uh, it turns out that uh, CME and flares are at last friends. Uh -huh. But uh, one thing to notice here that uh, flare and CME may be uncorrelated also, that whenever there is a flare, there need not to be a CME. And whenever there is a CME, there need not to be a flare. So it uh, boils down to this, that CME can have multiple sources. And what are these? One is the active region based. So flares are happening in active region. So how does it look? Like in this particular example, you see here that there is an active region on the left side and it ejects some matter in the space, which we see as CME in this particular example with a very bright leading edge and other materials. Yeah, So that's like kind of a huge CME for this particular case. Apart from these active regions, there are other kind of sources also, which are the prominence eruptions. So water prominence, I guess uh, it is well introduced uh, by previous speakers, Professor Dipanka Banerjee and uh, I guess Vibhuti also have spoken a few lines about it. So just looking, uh, just revising, 
Uh, prominence are the cool material which are suspended in the solar atmosphere. So if you can see my pointer here, so there is a red kind of thing, means dark red on the light red thing. So if I am not color blind, so those are the prominence uh, structure. Uh, and there is one, one more prominent kind of structure here, here, and there are many prominence here. So what happens because of some instability in their foot points, these kind of structures get erupted. The right one is actually the prominent er prominence eruption, which you see as a CME in the coronagraph field of view. On the left side also, you see an eruption, but you notice one thing here that though there is one uh, red structure erupting, but one of the foot points is actually close to an active region present there. So yeah, those kind of prominence are called the active region based prominence. And these ones which do not have any association with the active regions directly, those are called the quiescent prominence eruptions. So talking a little bit more about uh, this CME flare relationship. So yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah, that's the conclusion till now that it's complicated because solar flares, they can produce uh, uh, high energy things and uh, those can accelerate along with the magnetic field lines. And uh, yeah, there is a CME, which is capable of driving shocks. And when these shocks are generated, they can generate solar energetic particles again. So the electrons and other ions, they gyrate along the magnetic field lines. And CME itself contains magnetic field lines. Because uh, as I mentioned before, that there can be a flux rope embedded within the CME that is propagating outwards in the atmosphere. So this is uh, what is the final picture which uh, Dr. Gosling tried to uh, present in front of all of us that how this kind of space weather phenomena is actually happening. So the base of everything is the evolving solar magnetic field lines, whether it's sunspots or flares or CMEs. So the seed element is the magnetic field lines. If they directly reconnect, they can give rise to flare. But on the other hand, if there is some stability or buoyancy or some because of some reason, some instability in the foot points, they can give rise to coronal mass ejection, which may be because of the eruptive prominences. And if they are high, um, very fast enough, they can give rise to shocks, which generate again the solar energetic particles and radio uh, enhancement and other things. So the uh, variety, the variety in the uh, occurrence of this and reaching to Earth can vary from few days a uh, few minutes to few days and uh, like in case of flares those are get like uh, super uh, fast and they reach in like say few hours or so so these are the like the time scales uh, which we can observe these kind of phenomena reaching us because the flow flare intensity we uh, can note like say in eight minutes because light takes around eight minutes to reach from sun to earth but uh, the particle for particles to reach earth they can take from hours to few days so coming back to this particular picture uh, just now I told you that there can be particles, there can be uh, different speeds and all. So, uh, and CME also contains magnetic field with it. So, uh, the first panel shows actually the variation in magnetic field. BT and BZ are the two components, one in Z direction, T is the total magnetic field. So, you can see that there are fluctuations through time in this uh, magnetic field measurement by the uh, GO satellites around Earth. Similarly, for the density, like the number of particles per centimeter cube, so how much is the how much are the number of particles uh, varying with time? So uh, and then the speed, uh, the speed of particles which are reaching the Earth, and uh, the temperature as the temperature of those kind of particles. So here you can uh, see interestingly that um, there is a slight change in speed on this particular date, which may be because of such some. A space weather which can be addressed to some space weather phenomena because there is a, a change in speed there is change in density and uh, uh, some fluctuations in magnetic field though it's very feeble for this particular case because this is the recent one 28th uh, uh, June 2020 when we are in uh, solar minima but if you see the same plot in uh, solar maxima time like say five years from now you will see very much zigzag uh, patterns in this and all of a sudden you will see a kind of step function or a dip uh, yeah those are all the cool things that we can observe uh, with the change in solar cycle so finally what we concluded CME is the primary driver of space weather uh, apart from this yeah there can be like a co-driver or something like that flare but uh, this crown goes to CME for the time being. 
and if uh, CME are the primary drivers of space weather, then how does it vary with solar cycle? So you you have already heard about what is solar cycle from the previous speakers. Uh, so the very the eleven year periodicity in the sun support activity cycle, which was um, already established, and along with it, if we uh, find how many CMEs are occurring with. Uh, the time in the solar cycle, it was found that they are very well correlated. So here, do not get afraid uh, with cactus. Um, no one is talking about desert at present. So cactus and uh, CEDA are the two catalogs. Uh, one is the manu uh, manual one, CEDA, and cactus is an automated CME detection catalog in which you can see that uh, uh, they show an uh, increase in the number of CMEs per day. Uh, from solar minima to reaching to a maxima and then again decreasing. So during a minima time, uh, the one which uh, we are in at present, this number can vary from 1 to 2 CMEs per day to a maximum reaching to more than 10 per day. So imagining 10 CMEs occurring in the same day. Yeah, that's uh, that can be a fascinating number, but uh, be aware of that. Slightly going more on to the CME properties as these are the primary drivers, their angular width can again vary from uh, uh, 20 degrees, like in this particular example, a very narrow jet-like structure, which you may be even disregard to be called as CME. But yeah, that was that satisfies the definition that any white light structure moving outward in the coronagraph field of view. So yes, that satisfies it. Though in this image, it's not looking white because we have painted it red. But yeah, that is a CME. But uh, talking about normal CME width, so yeah, those are looking normal from the point of view of CME, having kind of three-part structure or like a bulb kind of shape or like a uh, balloon which is expanding out towards and um, the next one the white CME having a angular width of more than 120 degrees so when it is measured from this to around this if you uh, if it's visible in your screen this uh, angle is uh, more than like around 270 degree or something like that so that's like kind of very wide and uh, these you should be careful with these kind of events because these can uh, if this is showing such kind of uh, hello nature it means that it is it may be coming towards you so it's like the projection effect uh, you might have uh, uh, seen like uh uh, uh, when you are uh, expanding a balloon, you are blowing a balloon. If you look at it from the left side or right side, you will see the balloon is expanding like a, a long feature like this. But if you are seeing the same balloon moving uh, towards you, you will be seeing like kind of a circles moving towards you. So that is what Hello CME can be, like it, it can be moving towards you. And that's where most of the space weather effect can come into picture. And how fast these features can move through interplanetary space. So the speed can range from around 250 km per second to uh, more than 450. But the upper limit, yeah, people have even observed the CMEs going uh, to speed as high as 3000 km per second. So that's very huge number. And uh, how, how uh, this speed varies with uh, solar cycle. So again, there is one. Uh, uh, chart here so the speed can vary from say few hundred kilometer per second to say thousands of kilometer per second uh, from uh, to in the total uh, in the solar maxima so yes so you can expect uh, more uh, storms in uh, uh, already you expect more storms in the solar maximum and on the top of that you are expecting uh, high speed CMEs too in that and uh, how actually the CME kinematic profile looks like so it's something like this. So I mentioned you about LASCO C2 and C3 coronographs, which uh, starts observation from roughly two solar radii. So if you just draw the height time plot and uh, take your observations, so it looks something like this. But what about the location below it? I Means we don't have observations because uh, after LASCO C1, uh, there is no spacecraft which is continuously observing sun in this. So what is actually happening? So people try to address this by combining extreme ultraviolet images, so yeah, those uh, pretty colorful images which you saw in the beginning slides, and then they try to track uh, those kind of eruptions. But again, the features which you see in the emission lines may not be the same as you see in the white light images. So what can be done? So for this, as I already mentioned, that this field of view will be covered by Aditya L1. And then we will have information about the, what is actually happening to the CMEs in this particular region. And that will increase our understanding about the how the speed is varying and how the acceleration is varying. Because currently what we have done from the modeling and all this uh, black uh, curve that uh, CMEs initially accelerate, then decelerate, which is a zero acceleration, then again it accelerates. So what's actually happening? So the true nature, what happens in this region, 
Uh, so Aditya will be playing a very key role in that particular aspect. So coming back to what next? So this question I put uh, like in the few first five slides or something. Yeah, definitely CME is coming. So that's the next thing. So when a CME comes, so in this particular example uh, movie, if you see there is an eruption, uh, keep your eyes in the solar, uh, this speedometer also, that uh, it is in the green zone all the time. And then when that particular guy reaches the near earth environment, it reaches to even say red zone. And I guess if there were more data, more points in the speedometer, it would have crossed uh, that red zone also. So yeah, just one more time, just uh, see what this CME is uh, moving towards us and in the near earth region, what's actually happening. So not only particles, but uh, also the temperature, the magnetic field, everything gets uh, disrupted when uh, such kind of events are traveling from the solar surface, uh, which is shown here near the blue edge of the sun to the near earth environment. So yeah, so we are traveling from the edge of the sun, lower corona, solar corona, inner holosphere, and in the near earth environment where we have a speedometer kind of thing. Yeah, in, in reality, we don't have a speedometer like that, but we have a, a graph plotted uh, as you saw in the space weather report kind of thing. So uh, just to give you a brief idea, uh, uh, let me play you play for you one uh, clip from a movie. Uh, okay. <laughs> In this video, what you saw that uh, there are four astronauts along with their sponsor in a space station orbiting above Earth and all of a sudden some material came. So uh, some kind of solar storm, which uh, uh, if you look into the movie, so uh, uh, you will see that they had some prediction beforehand, but it arrived before time. So that astronaut, which was outside their spacecraft, he had to jump and uh, he faced uh, all those uh, extreme particles and magnetic field and all those kind of st stuff. And they were uh, even not able to shield themselves properly. So what happens after this particular event? This thing comes out, Fantastic Four. Yeah, those people get uh, some supernatural abilities. But in reality, can it actually happen? Uh, yeah, we don't know because uh, uh, it's really dangerous to test it because of the facts that we have at present. So uh, we are in an end game now. So what actually CME brings with it? Supercharged particles, shock, magnetic field, highly energetic particles trapped within the CME, the temperature, with the uh, temperature, say, like uh, some millions of Kelvin or tens of thousands of Kelvin again. So can you imagine, like, uh, just now we were talking, like, uh, in the temperature of, say, 45 to 50 degrees Celsius, we are feeling very hot. And imagine some tens of thousands of Kelvin temperature reaching to your body. So definitely you are not going to become a superhero like Fantastic Four. You will be getting fried up. So the, the definition of temperature varies depending on uh, what temperature you are defining. So uh, looking back to this particular picture, so uh, as you know that uh, Earth has its own magnetic field. So whenever a solar storm like that comes to Earth, two things can happen. So you know Earth's magnetic field starts from the North Pole and goes towards the South Pole. Uh, I would like to mention here that it's not the geometric uh, North, but the magnetic North and geometric South are aligned, more or less. So the field lines are coming from the magnetic north going towards the magnetic south. The direction is upwards and if the CME along with the solar wind, the direction of the magnetic field is opposite to Earth's magnetic field, then what will happen? Again, the reconnection, like they like each other, they will attract each other and they will just hold their hands here. And what will happen? If Imagine if there is a spacecraft locating here, like uh, in our superhero movie also, there was a, a space station here. So 
you know that uh, these uh, contains uh, um, different metallic instruments and what happens when you move a magnet inside a coil like a metal so whenever there is a changing magnetic field you uh, use this part, uh, famous guy's uh, relation uh, and induce uh, electromotive force in your conductor so you are experiencing a current so already you have some uh, things happening you have some uh, circuits inside it inside the satellite and all of a sudden you are getting a surge in uh, uh, electricity so what will happen it will fry your system so your satellite can go bad so that's something what happened uh, during the 2003 um, halloween storm that uh, uh, when they were not shut down in the proper time those were the instruments were fried the circuits were fried and uh, that's why uh, even those broadcasts were hampered because uh, Earth, um, Earth's uh, atmosphere, not just because of the magnetic field uh, affecting the satellite, but also those charged particles can enter the solar atmosphere and uh, interact with the satellite in the lower Earth orbits and even disturb the ionosphere, which is basically responsible for the reflection of uh, uh, the uh, communication from our ground. So, yeah, so that's where this kind of reconnection comes into picture and summarizing this uh, same thing in this thing uh, in this particular picture so uh, the, for, for the similar region, reasons the electric grids can also fail because if those charged particles can come to uh, lower latitudes so what can happen that they will overcharge uh, uh, the conductors and the transformers and all of a sudden there can be a blackout and uh, we have already talked about the astronauts on board uh, say international space station or rockets or uh, um, different satellites especially our communication satellites and all and one more thing you should notice that uh, whenever if you are traveling to US uh, generally flight takes the polar path because it's uh, fuel efficient and also it takes less time but during such kind of solar activity the polar regions are highly vulnerable because more number of charged particles can come in these regions so uh, during those kind of storms flights are generally redirected so that people are not affected by those kind of charged particles entering the solar atmosphere so yes uh, this has happened in the past that uh, flights have been redirected so uh, this is natural phenomena so yeah so now we have a bit of understanding about uh, CMEs and uh, solar wind stuff uh, space weather so this kind of precautionary measures can be taken beforehand so let's talk about another scenario uh, till now we talked about the same kind of um, uh, opposite kind of magnetic field lines coming towards earth but what if the similar polarity the upward going magnetic field lines come toward the earth in that case these field lines will deflect from the uh, sun facing side uh, bend and uh, reconnect in the night side and when this happens the charged particles will enter the earth's atmosphere from the night side and that's when you see the beautiful auroras because those charged particles interact with oxygen and nitrogen from our atmosphere and give rise to such kind of beautiful structures yes i also do want to visit such kind of place yeah along with milky way so yeah that's perfect capture for astrophotography also so just uh, summarizing this particular uh, thing in a video thing for a better illustration uh, when opposite uh, lead directly magnetic field lines uh, comes in context you can see that uh, the magnetic field lines becomes less in number now only one is remaining at the same time also the charged particles are entering the earth's atmosphere in the polar regions and these are getting deflected towards the earth's ninth side so this is kind of uh, combining uh, both the uh, uh, scenarios into one and when this happens, uh, you can see that auroras are happening in the polar regions. And if uh, uh, apart from this uh, uh, Arctic Circle region or the North Pole, if you see uh, auroras to uh, even lower latitudes, let's say if you see it in Africa, then yeah, we are really in danger that it's a very huge geomagnetic storm. So uh, that's why we don't see auroras in India or some equatorial regions because uh, uh, magnetic poles don't close at this particular location but only near the uh, our geometric polar locations also so remember this guy so let's see what happens okay he disappeared now so what are the effects of space weather so these kind of uh, um, uh, events can produce beautiful aurora borealis the northern lights or aurora australis the southern lights but apart from this what can happen you can disrupt your communication radiation hazards to astronauts spacecraft 
Ah, also from uh, also through the uh, flights taking the northern uh, the polar routes. Then there can be surges in the power lines, uh, orbital degradation like the case of Skylab, and also I didn't talk about corrosion in the oil pipelines. But all these kind of things can happen just because of some particles coming from space along with some magnetic field line. So yeah, the panic mo is the panic mode on. Uh, I guess so. Uh, yeah, the, what do you do uh, in such kind of scenario? What do we do when uh, for the local weather? So there are forecasters. Uh, someone will come in the news channel and they'll tell, okay, hey, there is there will be more rainfall in this particular region. The wind direction are so and so, and the temperature are uh, some degree Celsius in the, the different location. And when such kind of scenarios happen, so you can also look into your cricket match. Okay, they, it's cloudy or sunny. We'll play a match today. So yeah, so that's what people working in solar physics also do. They forecast. So we have a Community Coordinated Modeling Center, CCMC, funded by NASA and, uh, and National Science Foundation, NSF. So they have different tools. They uh, uh, do the observation, they do modeling, and then they try to relate the observations with the models and try to forecast that when is that CME or that kind of storm coming to us and how intense and how severe those kind of uh, uh, activities can be to Earth and to us. So just to give you an example, there was a CME, uh, Earth Directed, and you can see that uh, this particular thing which uh, launched from Sun towards Earth uh, along with the spiral. So spirals are always there, which are called particle spiral, but uh, a CME is launched and it uh, was directed towards the Earth and these people forecasted. But space weather forecasting is uh, not easy enough because uh, you have 10 to power, say, 15 kilometers of distance between sun and earth. And on the top of that, you have observation only up to 30 solar radii. That will be just covering not even the inner circle. So you have just observation up to that. And recently, there were heliospheric observatories, like which will be observing the sun-earth line, like in that movie, which, were, uh, which could cover completely from the sun to earth distance. But then also, we do not have... Uh, uh, too much uh, information we are still improvising to make our this kind of space weather forecasting more accurate and provide um, uh, uh, better results so that uh, uh, that damages can could be avoided so just imagine that uh, you are talking to your partner in the middle of night communication goes out because of the CME so for that you need a better forecasting thing so yeah solar physics is interesting so that's perhaps the last thing I wanted to tell and uh, if you want uh, more information about that kind of uh, these kind of tools you can just uh, search for CCMC NASA or CCMC CME you can get to this particular link where you can look into the different tools or if anyone is interested they can just uh, contact me I can share this uh, particular thing with them and uh, yeah so that's the last thing i wanted to show uh, about the corona uh, the total solar eclipse the beautiful one which uh, i traveled around 40 hours and thousands of kilometer to last year to witness this particular thing and uh, believe me there is no dragon that's coming and eating the sun and in, as in some kind of traditions but it's a natural phenomena and definitely everyone should get uh, uh, to see this thing with their own eyes so leaving you with this particular thought which i got like solar physics is not just about looking at pretty cool images of the sun but it's also about taking one and interesting thing this is from mobile only like you i have captured using mobile so yeah do not get disheartened if you do not have a camera the mobile is always there thank you Thank you, questions. So there are some questions. Okay, uh, Indranil sir is saying that uh, argument by Gosling about flares, could you clarify uh, them again? So yeah, so uh, initially when uh, people used to observe flares and uh, they used to relate it with uh, whatever the phenomena that were uh, being observed in the earth. So there, as there were no, not much uh, coronagraph observation initially, uh, so people observed flare on the solar disk and few days later they had some kind of shock or magnetic disturbances on the earth. So in that case, people used to believe that these are caused by the flares. There is something happening on the sun and uh, that's being propagated uh, to uh, Earth by the magnetic connection, the magnetic field lines in the sun-Earth line. So uh, that was the initial argument. But uh, 
uh, it was found that around half of the events which happen on the earth the geomagnetic disturbances do not have relation to the flares so people used to just conjecture that there can be some other thing like a flare may be faint or something like that uh, which were uh, because of our sensitivity of the detectors uh, but then this uh, Gosling, uh, John Gosling, the, he tried to uh, observe, uh, use the coronal uh, uh, mass ejection data also. So then he was uh, able to connect this link that CME was present always whenever there was a disturbance on the earth. Whether it's a big disturbance or the small disturbance, then also there was a kind of uh, relation. So CME played a major role in driving the uh, space weather activities rather than uh, the flares. So that was uh, what uh, he tried to put forward. Uh, coming to your next point, about a deco decade ago, there were confusion about the exact tri triggering mechanism of CME. Has that been settled? Uh, yeah, so cu currently also we have uh, uh, different models uh, explaining what triggers the CME. So basically two types of uh, 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 sources for CMEs have been identified. One is based on the reconnection which arises uh, along with the flares. Another thing is uh, with the prominences. So the eruptive prominences can also give rise to CMEs. So these are the two main scenarios that has been established at present. Uh, another one from Indranil sir again, but I thought fast solar winds are about around 500 km per second at around 1 AU. So how does CME stands out compared to the solar winds? Yes, you're right. Uh, the solar winds uh, speed can also range from 200 to even 600 km per second. So uh, what actually happens, uh, like whenever a CME is ejected from the sun, uh, it uh, gets an initial acceleration, the speed can go as high as say 1000 km per second and after a few solar radii it uh, degrades and uh, forms, uh, uh, means it decreases, decelerates and uh, reaches the solar wind speed. So it's like uh, uh, already uh, in a river, it's a fl uh, river is flowing with water and uh, you put something to it, it will get uh, with the flow. So similarly it's happening like uh, solar wind is there. CME is there, finally it reaches the solar wind speed. Then what happens? Uh, CME has enhancement in the particles as well as the magnetic field. So whenever the, that stream reaches Earth, you see an enhancement uh, in the magnetic field, particle density, and that's how you say that, okay, CME has been reached. So all those space weather diagrams, the GOES uh, uh, wave panels, which I showed, so uh, in those uh, uh, panels, if there is an enhancement in the density, the number of particles or uh, like the change in the magnetic field structure, so then we say that, okay, this is a CME and not just uh, the solar wind. The second person to ask the question, Rohit Padi, what are the parameters of CME that are used in analysis and how are they incorporated while studying them? Okay, Rohit, so... Uh, the different parameters which are measured for CME are basically its uh, propagation speed which we measure in successive frames, how wide the CME and what is the acceleration because the acceleration will be defining that what uh, at what speed it is expected to reach earth because uh, uh, you have observation only up to say 30 solar radii which is some a uh, few million kilometers but uh, after that also there is a, a lot of distance left so those kind of uh, things are put into say models like how wide the CME has become what is the speed and what the final speed that we can expect and depending on the brightness we also calculate that uh, uh, what is the expected mass of the CME that we can uh, expect at different uh, location because uh, CME is expanding the density is becoming less and less. Shirsa asked, are CMEs generated by solar flares? So this is this was a debatable topic, but now it is settled like CMEs and flares may be related. Uh, one may not be the cause of other, but it can be seen uh, one after the other as a cause and effect kind of thing, like CME has happened and at the base because of the instability, like I showed you in a, one example of magnetic reconnection. If I just uh, go back, uh, okay, there will be n number of slides, I guess. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, slow, slow. Uh, yeah, as in this particular example, if you see uh, here, if I uh, 
tell you that reconnection is happening at the center location. So when this reconnection happens, the, the temperature can uh, rise up to million degree Kelvin. And when it happens, it can release uh, the electromagnetic impulse, which is observed at different uh, wavelengths and uh, at the top of this kind of loops, which we uh, see as the flare. So in the standard flare CME model, yes, CME and flare are related, but it's not necessarily that flare alone is the cause for the CME. They can be independent also because there are many cases uh, where uh, there are flares, but there are uh, no signatures of CME. And uh, as in the next slide also I have shown, uh, like uh, the, there can be prominence eruption also that can give, that are giving rise to CMEs. Yeah. Okay, I guess there are more. Okay. Uh -huh. So the next question is by Harshita Gandhi. Which role do flares play for CMEs onset and further fate? So yeah, I guess we are in the right slide. So uh, as I told just now, uh, yeah, like whenever there is this kind of configuration where oppositely directly ma directed magnetic field lines come close to each other and they reconnect in this particular location. Uh, so what happens? Uh, uh, this uh, The flux rope is injected outwards, which forms the CME. And the remaining loops, they go down and they settle down. And the top of these kind of loops is heated um, to millions of Kelvin. And that releases those kind of brightenings. And not only the uh, loop top, but also the foot points. So all, all these things happen within few minutes. Like this is ejected and uh, this is heated and generated flares. But this rising phase, the, uh, the initial rise, when this uh, field lines are still getting closer, appears as uh, CME is initial precursor point when the CME is just about to launch. But the flares uh, which are in the uh, solar surface, they uh, slowly cool down and um, they get settled out. So uh, you can see in the spectrum that uh, uh, they initially starts with hard X-ray, then soft X-ray, UV, and then, then slowly uh, decays down. And then you can see the new set of loops which are formed after the reconnection, the re new uh, reconfigured loop kind of structure. So that's actually uh, the, the flare dies out and uh, it, the intensity comes back to normal. Whereas uh, CM is onset and uh, yeah, CM is launched in the space, but uh, uh, it travels through the solar system and interacts with other planets also. So there is an interesting study in which uh, people uh, uh, use, uh, used uh, the different spacecraft which were present in say Mars, uh, Jupiter and even beyond that and then encountered a very big uh, uh, continuous observation of uh, CME uh, at the different uh, locations. The next question, how far do the, uh, do the, uh, okay, the next question is again from Harshita ma'am. How far do the sun, the SEPs extend? So SEPs are actually the charged particles, which uh, actually are uh, produced either from these kind of sites, which uh, uh, like uh, provides a kind of impulse to the particles around his, or the uh, particles which are lying above the CMEs and uh, interacts with the shock. So in those kind of situations, what we detect from the Earth, so uh, SEPs are defined all on the, uh, all from the point of view of Earth. And uh, till now, uh, this kind of enhancement are also seen, uh, like in the combined study from Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, those spacecrafts. So yes, the, these particles indeed travel along the magnetic field lines till the uh, 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 point where a sun's magnetic influence is present. So yes, SEPs, uh, though it may not uh, appear as uh, uh, we, we see in our coronagraph images after that, because those observations are from one astronomical uh, unit, the sun Earth distance, but uh, uh, from the further points, only we see the enhancement in uh, particle density, the temperature and uh, those kind of things. So yeah, so if it's, uh, if it's not clear, you can directly write to me. So yeah, I guess uh, that's it. So. Thank you. So I guess uh, there is an announcement. If someone misses today's lecture or the past lectures, those are already available in Facebook, YouTube, and uh, yeah, you can uh, even uh, uh, share with your friends, whoever is interested, they can join. So like our Facebook and YouTube page, share and subscribe. So that's for today. Thank you.